Okay, hello there. So after a few technical uh, issues, um, this is um, a Kensington Kilburn Better 2021 20, vodcast about um, uh, mixed realities, virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, basically future, future realities, how new technology can bring the past to life. That's our, our discussion uh, title for today. Um, so I've got with me here, Marisa Dima, um, who is a researcher into human computer interaction. Um, and she's gonna be talking today about some of these technologies and we might be touching a little bit on how uh, they uh, interact with social and uh, political reality as well. Um, but it depends on how much time we have. Um, so yes, so uh, my, yes, and I forgot to say my name is uh, Tom Leonard. So anyway, over to you, Marisa. Um, so can you tell me uh, about uh, the differences between mixed reality systems and describe for me augmented reality and virtual reality for, uh, for, our, for our listeners? Sure, hi, hi, Tom. Um, so uh, the, we have augmented and virtual reality and these are part of a larger spectrum um, that is called mixed reality as it was defined in 1995, I think by Mil, um, uh, Milgram, that's um, a researcher. And uh, so we have in this spectrum from so on one end is the real world is the reality. And then on the other, uh, on the other end of the spectrum is the virtual reality. And in between there are two states. So first we have, as we, as we move from the real, from the reality that we have augmented reality, which is the, uh, the reality superimposed with some digital material. Uh, so which you can, you need a camera to see it. So you could be on your mobile phone. And as I'll be talking about a bit later on, on a pair of smart glasses as well. Uh, then you have uh, augmented virtuality, which is the virtual world that includes physical aspects. So it could be like a video or a kind of a um, hologram uh, uh, of, of a real person in a virtual world. And then we have virtual reality, which is a totally virtual environment constructed um, you know, from scratch. And there's nothing physical in there. That's the other end of the spectrum. Uh, so all of that is mixed reality. Uh, but now lately, um, especially since we talk more and more, and you can see in the media more and more uh, augmented virtual reality projects and applications and, and stories, uh, it has been used a little bit as a term to define anything that includes uh, either or AR and VR, uh, which is the initials for augmented and virtual reality. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you for giving me the definitions again, because we had some technical problems earlier <laughs> on. And uh, anyway, we've, we've, we've just, yeah, so it's, it's good to practice though, when you're, when you're going to be uh, um, doing a vodcast. Uh, so yes, so, so these are some interesting um, technologies, I suppose. And I guess the kind of thing that people might think about if they were just imagining this on a very simple level might be something like, well, Snapchat perhaps, or filters that you, or, or things that you get on your phone for taking pictures uh, on things like TikTok as well, or maybe things like Pokemon Go we were talking about earlier on. So yeah, is, it just, is, is this the kind of simplest level of this? And Yeah, yeah. So you see, you see these applications uh, even more in the last, uh, like, five or six years. Um, Pokemon Go was the one that popularized actually the use of, uh, of AR, um, where you would go around the, the physical environment chasing uh, Pokemons. And uh, then of course you have Snapchat with all these filters where you can have like ears uh, uh, and, uh, and all sorts of other things uh, around your face, like you have some filters on. Uh, and there's also companies that have used it quite extensively, like the, it's used in the beauty industry to um, try on different kind of, for example, lipsticks or eyeshadows. And I've seen this, at least in London, uh, being uh, uh, promoted a lot now with, because with COVID, you cannot have samples in, in the stores. So all, all of the kind of beauty brands have a QR code, which you can scan, and then you can go into this uh, app and, and try on different colors. Um, of, of uh, beauty products. And uh, IKEA as well, for example, has an app where you can put the furniture in your living room and see how they would fit. 
uh, from your, from their app before even going there to buy them. So you can kind of check out uh, from your mobile phone to see how uh, this will look like. Uh, and plenty other uses uh, in, in this way. So uh, yeah, I think by now the, the general public is quite, um, uh, you know, informed, like the kind of, uh, they have used at least once like an, an AR app um, uh, for, for different kind of things. It's not, it's not as, um, you know, hidden behind research as it used to be like a decade ago. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I get. Yeah. It seems to have, have, have started to appear in in um, in shops and and um, companies using this to to sell their products. Um, so I guess yeah. So moving away a little bit from the kind of companies trying to sell their pro products, you've spent a lot of time. Well, 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 on your podcast, Mixed Reality in Cultural Heritage, that's the name of the, the podcast, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which you can find on Spotify, uh, if you if you take a look. Um, talk, for example, talking to people who are involved with more kind of cultural, social pro projects and how they're using these technologies to do some very interesting and exciting things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know you were involved with this Sutton House project, for example, which was a kind of bringing that house to life. So can you describe maybe one yeah. of these projects or some of these things? <clears throat> sure. So I've been researching uh, VR and AR for, for more than a decade now, but I have a particular interest in the heritage field and in history. Um, so I, a lot of, I, have, I used to do a lot of projects with that, with the VR and AR, and lately I have been very much interested in the smart glasses that I mentioned before, which is a pair of glasses that you can put on. Uh, it's, not, it's a little bit heavier and a bit more bulky than a normal kind of pair of glasses, uh, but there is work being done on that uh, as well by many companies. So it's not in the not very ne near future, but certainly uh, in the future, you know, we could have like commodity glasses that can deliver uh, AR content um, like that. So, um, so I use these glasses in a, in a historic site, in a historic stage, in an, in an old house, uh, Tudor era house in Hackney in London. Uh, to design an experience for visitors where they could put on the glasses and go into a kind of a, a journey uh, of the house, uh, being accompanied by different uh, characters through different voices, uh, seeing things at the same time. There were some animations, um, soundscapes, music, uh, etc. And as part of this project, I was very much interested to work with the heritage industry as well to see what are their challenges. And I also brought together heritage professionals and uh, AR developers and designers uh, like myself to kind of try and understand how best to tell the stories of the past. So this device, and as well as as well as mobiles, um, mobile AR has um, has immense potential in 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 bringing like the stories out um, in a way that you. Uh, as a visitor feel engaged and um, uh, I'm trying to avoid saying immersed because this is a, <laughs> a word that has a lot of weight and it's not easy to measure it. Um, so for me it was the, the most uh, important part was not to necessarily measure immersion or anything like that, but to create an experience that uh, will indeed be fun and engaging for the visitors and at the same time uh, educational as well. So they could like get out some, something of this experience in terms of learning about the house, learning about the, the, the people who inhabited this house, um, uh, etc. So and while I was doing this project and all the people that I met in the process and I organized also a symposium last year, which was well online <laughs> because of COVID, um, I realized that there are a lot of challenges who have been here for many years and unsolved. And especially like the more the technology advances, uh, the more we need to tackle these challenges because we've got like on the one hand, the technology that like, you know, the, you've got a lot of like uh, development, but also the, at the same time, you have the heritage sites who you have different um, needs and also uh, different challenges in terms of adopting, uh, adopting and adapting to these new technologies. So I thought that there's a lot of things that could make actually a podcast. <laughs> and that's how I started um, 
uh, talking to a lot of people uh, from the heritage industry, from the uh, games industry as well, who work with uh, with the heritage, who create games for heritage uh, with AR as well. So I'm particularly uh, interested in in you know mixed reality applications in heritage, um, going like investigating this technology. Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. Um, I mean. There, there obviously must there, there are going to be different issues that pop up, I suppose, with, with, with the advancement of this technology. And I mean, for me, it presents such an interesting a possible uh, application for people who want to explore um, stories that are forgotten about to kind of present narrative histories, to kind of give voice to people who have been forgotten about, have been marginalized uh, or forgotten from history for some reason. And that's that I think is a really interesting and powerful element of it. Um, and that kind of is, is why I think it's social and politically interesting and for kind of, you know, progressives like me, I think it's, it's a powerful tool. Yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry. No, so I was going to say that, like, uh, as you mentioned, I didn't, I, I didn't mention that before that I was, um, in this particular, uh, project because it was a little bit about also kind of acceptance of technology and seeing how things work. Um, we work with the house and the educators there to present the stories um, that existed. Uh, not we 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 dug a little bit into some more kind of marginalized stories, uh, and there were very many interesting things uh, that that were there um, uh, in terms of sociopolitical as well. So it was one of the. Um, uh, the, the house used to be one of the first, like, I think, uh, uh, girl school in Hackney. Um, so we didn't really use a lot of marginalized stories in this one, but we did um, think of the potential of AR to actually do this. And that will be one of, you know, the next projects that I'm, I'm, I'm going to do on how you can use AR and what it offers uh, to, to tell marginalized stories and to help also kind of reframe narratives that have been, you know, for a long time uh, set and not changed. And for example, like uh, colonial narratives, which, you know, are, you know, exist in, in, in many places still. So, and the what do you like the, how AR is useful for that is that because it um, it animates the past and when I say the past is about people and stories and items like objects um, um, or you can give you a sense of the community that used to be there and and all that um, it's interesting how you can experience this through AR in a more kind of vivid uh, way uh, and potentially interact with them as well in many different ways. So it's not really, it's not very static. It's still um, uh, counts on the visitor imagination, uh, but you can, you can showcase many more things with that rather than like the, um, you know, the, just the leaflets and, uh, and, and the labels and the, the audio guides, which are, you know, super nice tools, but also you can, uh, you can find what works well with them and then transfer that into an AR uh, experience design. Yeah, it's, it is, it is, it is really fascinating. This, yeah, this, this application, um, and the fact that you can interact as well, which makes it, mm. which makes it more interesting uh, again. Um, I mean, you know, it was only just thinking yesterday, it was the anniversary of that statue being pulled down in, in um, Bristol, Bristol, the Colston, yeah. the Colston statue that was pulled down. Mm -hmm. And a city like Bristol, if you were to go around and you had some kind of augmented technology, you know, there'd be, his there'd be history of colonialism, the history of colonialism would be everywhere on, on mm -hmm. many buildings, in many places, in many people's uh, sort of lived experience, you know, so you've got that potential to kind of bring that to life. Anyway, we don't want to get too too sidetracked by that, but yeah, it's it's it, it is it is interesting. Um, and another kind of aspect of that, I suppose, was I when I was listening to some of your podcast episodes, you had the stories of various people who've kind of come up against difficulties with trying to get this technology applied or or or, or trying to use it for their projects. For example, there was the guy talking about trying to get, get hold of local records for uh, his um, uh, Hamlet's... Um, yeah, Dietmar yes. with Hamlet's Breed, um, yeah, the game. Yeah. Yes, 
and also the guy with the, the blacksmithing saying that other people in the blacksmithing community were a bit like didn't like it well he a bit sort of resistant to his virtual you know, this is a virtual reality blacksmithing uh, yeah. project for context so yes yeah, so do you think this is this is a this is a there's a there's a there's a chance that there's lots of history or there's a lot of ch there's a chance there's chance there's a chance that there's a lot of history that people don't necessarily want to talk about or there's resistance for or kind of academic establishment reasons maybe <clears throat> sometimes <clears throat> I think I think uh, yeah, Dietmar was talking about like accessing to the archives thing, which is kind of a different. Uh, okay. Yeah, maybe that's that's like probably a, like an issue in some cases. Mm. Um, I think that the best people to ask is the actually local and indigenous people whose stories have been marginalized and. I think that they would be very eager to share to share these stories. Uh, I don't think there would be like much resistance there, um, especially if they come as co-designers in the experience, in a sense, mm. um, or at least what they're consulted and you know throughout throughout the design process and development process. Mm. Yes. Uh, so, be because you're te you're actually telling their stories. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you have the the opportunity to they have the opportunity to see um, uh, their stories are being uh, you know um, shared and 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 uh, shared with everyone and um, which also uh, and I, I don't know if it's still the case right now but I knew that a couple of years ago um, was a big uh, part of why certain groups didn't visit museums for example in in the UK. Because uh, they felt that their histories were not represented inside the museum, yeah. uh, so I think it's part of the wider decolonization of the museum process that a lot of UK now institutions uh, have, like you know, started undergo. So, um, in terms of access to the archives, and I think I think we discussed that with Itmar as well. I don't think in the UK there wasn't much of an issue here. Um, I think it's quite easy to um, to have access to these, and in fact, in my work with heritage uh, educators and hist historians and public historians, uh, I have seen that they're very eager to bring the archives out because they sit there, you know, dusting, uh, dusted in a in a corner, and uh, there's so much material that never makes it out to the to be actually exhibited. Mm. Yeah. So if there are anything that can, you know, be useful in the construction of the stories that is already in the archive, it's actually a great way to keep them alive, in a sense, it's kind of a living memory. Yes. Yes, I, I guess it is. And of course, there's the fact, I suppose, that a lot of groups who may have been the subject of a perhaps refugee status at some point or mm -hmm. uh, have a transient lifestyle in some way, haven't really got the kind of concrete geography that that facilitates remembering your history or being able to kind of have your history recorded somewhere yeah so that's a kind of an element of that isn't it like the mm -hmm. route that people use and kind of yeah so this kind of it's interesting this kind of this application preserving traditions remembering things that can't be that aren't recorded uh yeah interacting with the past that's been been overwritten or forgotten or mm -hmm. as a, you know yeah, it's, it's really it's really interesting in that way. As a slightly different issue, but a related issue, I suppose there's a with the pandemic, people have been uh, possibly getting a bit of fatigue when it comes to technology, Zoom calls, yeah. um, and uh, sitting in front of screens. And there's been some suggestion that 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 people's that school children, for example, their education is suffering. Um, as a result of you know too much screen time, too much screen interaction, mm -hmm. uh, and I know this from from being a teacher as well. That some of my students are very very miserable being stuck on Zoom all the time doing their, okay. their lessons. <laughs> um, so yeah, so do you think this could be this kind of technology also could be a way to kind of revitalize um, the learning process as well? 
Uh, or is there a chance that people might be resistant because it's technology? Or what do you think about that? I mean, I don't know how much in re- a relation this will have with the how over Zoomed we are all uh, after this mm. year. I don't think it's the same thing because once you put on the glasses and you, you know, you go into this, and I think I'm saying the glasses, it's important for me because as opposed to the mobile, you don't have to hold something. I guess mm. it's, this is really tiring. With the glasses, you can go on for a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it's really different because you're kind of entering a hybrid world where, you know, you see things that like make you go like a little bit, wow. Um, but also the design of how these things make you go oh, uh, is important, which, you know, uh, is something that we can talk about. Um, uh, when I, I did my evaluation of the project before uh, the pandemic started, and although they were like they were discussing about some usability issues, which are known. For example, there is a certain the the glasses don't have huge, let's say, peripheral vision, so you only have a small field of view whereby you can see the virtual uh, things. Um, so there were these are known issues, and it has to do with the hardware of the technology. But everyone that attended, and we're talking about like more than 35 participants now, uh, they said that uh, it, was a, it was a great experience because it brought the house back to life. And I think if you are um, at this point where you go through an experience that makes you feel so engaged, then I don't think it is the same with watching something on a PC, on a, on a, on a screen. Hmm. So it's a kind of a more, you're not passive. Um, and by saying passive, I don't mean that you are interacting necessarily, but you're like moving. It's a whole body experience. It's an embodied experience. Uh, you go around the house, you see things, you might want to get, kind of go closer. Uh, and possibly also, you know, there's a lot of gestures that you can do so you can grab stuff and move them and, and do things like this. Um, and it is a, a and an, a, and because you can actually use the, your your body and your senses in order to go together with a story or you know um, interact in a way that's not necessarily interacting with the characters. For example, we had uh, at some point some shoes dancing a minuet, which is an old uh, dance that the child the the children the girls were trying to learn in the in that part of the story. Uh, and you could hear also the giggles and uh, running and the, and the teacher was trying to <laughs> make them participate in the, in the lesson. Um, and you could, some, some, some of, the, of the people went around and started to try and understand how they do the minuet, you know, following the shoes. So you've got place, uh, like, um, the, uh, an experience like this, which are called inactive, right? So we are learning through the body and through the senses. So you've got embodiment, you've got an action. Even if you don't have that much of interaction, like I'm not talking about going and having a dialogue with with a 3D character. This actually might be counterintuitive, to be honest, in my opinion. Uh, So once you have this, then you are engaged. Uh, uh, I mean, this is what the evaluation showed, right? And in terms of learning, it's extremely difficult to do a short-term evaluation of learning. Uh, And also, what what does learning mean? Do I want what do I want? Do I want knowledge retention? Like, do you remember the date that this house was built after the experience? I don't really want this kind of knowledge. I'm more interested about whether some of these stories, and it's through stories that we humans learn, uh, have actually left a bit of a small like uh, 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 print footprint in their mind, so that in like a year's time they might actually not remember necessarily the name, but remember that this um, place used to be a men's institute and a lot of men died in the First World War. Uh, and, you know, which was part of the, of the, of the, one of the stories that was taught in the experience, or that it used to be a girl's school and they were trying to learn the minuet. So what about that like uh, era, they were doing these things. Um, and the way that I managed to measure this is that there is literature that says that once you are engaged in an activity, you learn. So I measured engagement instead. 
I didn't me measure immersion and I didn't measure learning. I measured engagement. And, you know, and the both of the evaluation, which was done with the specific methods where you kind of construct meaning in a written way, and also the focus groups that we did, it showed that actually a lot of the, a lot of the participants did really, um, did, if they had even forgotten names after <laughs> the experience immediately, but they did, you know, they said that they will remember these stories. And that's the important, that's the important thing. Hmm. Yeah. And I could also talk a little bit about the design and why, you know, the design was as it is. So for me, in order to create engagement, I didn't want to just create a representation of the virtual object. So here is a vase. <laughs> And this is how it used to be like, you know, or if you actually see it, you, if you have a physical broken item, you can take, bring it up to the glasses and then glasses can um, make it feel full, like as it was, right? Give you a, a how, what's the broken part like. Uh, that was not my intention. I wanted to use the glasses and the AR aspect as a storytelling medium. So it was still stories that were being told by three people who lived in the house in, across the four centuries. Um, and the, the, the digital material was just complementary to this experience. And sometimes there was digital material that was, has not, had nothing to do with the stories, but just gave a background. For example, there was a real fireplace in a room and we had a virtual fire with fire crack, crackling sounds. There was one, one participant who actually was trying to find out where the fire is <laughs> from the beginning because she could hear like the the, the crackling sounds so which was which was nice um so this kind of like you know background things that make the place a little bit more real but it's you know they're not real uh actually and my focus then was on emotion creating emotion an emotional response and i think that this is also a big part of how people learn so it's not only about stories but it's about the effect that the stories has in you as a visitor. Because whenever we visit these places, we always try to, we, we are, we're, we're being part of a process which is called meaning making. So what does it mean this house and the, and, and the, the history of the house that I learn about? What does it tell me about the people who live there? Uh, and what do I understand? How do I understand this history? And what does it tell me about me? You know, how do I perceive and everyone every single visitor in the house has a different understanding and perception of the history and uh, interprets it in a different way. So the, uh, the AR gives you an opportunity for this interpretation and how the AR is going to be designed is very important on how you're gonna, how, how it will guide you to meaning making. Uh, and for me, emotional, the emotional aspect, uh, which not, is not only the emotion is also the emotion and the embodiment and the inactive response, all of this is what I call like the affective, affective storytelling. So um, it's about creating these, these uh, snapshots where you feel engaged because you connect to the characters, to their stories, uh, and everything that is digital there is there to support this connection. It's not actually the focus of the, the experience, is the supporting, um, I, uh, supporting, um, uh, I don't know, things. <laughs> things. Butter in the sandwich of the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the yeah. so, um, yeah. And then I, and be, because I did that, I turned into theater to understand. Ah, uh, yes, that was something else we were going to talk about. It was a little oh. bit about the interaction with theater, weren't we? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I just thought, yeah, that's a good, a good time to segue actually into that. Um, so yeah, so talk, maybe you can talk a little bit about the interaction with theatre. Yeah, so I was, uh, I was trying to design that. I found myself asking questions such as, uh, who am I that I'm going to wear these glasses? And what am I doing here? I mean, obviously, like, I'm a little bit from games design. So my questions are always like, what is the goal? And what's the setting? And what's the narrative? And, uh, you know, what do I have to do? So... Uh, I guess I so I started that and then I, I thought that in order to create this kind of narrative arcs and uh, to guide the visitor through the different stories, you need some kind of uh, framework to um, to bind things to uh, bind things together. 
uh, that I, I didn't have. And so I turned into theater to look on how do you create, how do you orchestrate these things? And that's where I started reading about the uh, art of dramaturgy. Um, and I am making uh, a, a kind of a parallel between the work of an AR designer and the work of a dramaturg for theater, because it's all about an orchestration, uh, connecting different parts in order to, to enable and support meaning making. So the dramaturgs do it for the audience, for the theater audience, but the AR designer can do it for, uh, for, the, for those who will go through the experience. So I started making these parallels and um, together with everyone else that was involved in the project, we uh, tried to create these moments um, that, can, you know, that can give us engaging stories um, and, and, and structure this kind of embodied and an active experience. And at the end, uh, uh, I was really, <laughs> I really wanted to bind also all of these things together again in a unifying narrative because it was uh, for me it was really nice to have all these different stories and go through the experience, uh, you know, in different parts of the of the space. Uh, but then in the end, I didn't want it to uh, end suddenly and like and that's it. Thank you very much. Now you can go. <laughs> so uh, the. And I was trying, I was trying for, for a long time to find this connecting narrative. And in the end, uh, I thought also a little bit because of personal experience as well, when I visit these places, uh, I'm always fascinated by the, you know, the memories that exist and, and the fact that you actually go and find them. Uh, and then the, you take something from, from it and then, you know, you go back doing your own life. Um, and then I started thinking about the spaces and how much they are visited and how much all of these living uh, archives are being like kept alive because you have people visiting the houses and, you know, you have people interested in their histories and the, the histories of the people that and the communities that exist and around them. So uh, the, the unifying narrative that I found was exactly this. It was kind of like allowing at the very, very end of the experience, the visitor, a moment of reflection about the house and about the heritage and about what keeps it alive. So when the last story was given by the, um, the, the person who built the house, who was uh, Sir, Sir Ralph Sadler, it's a very difficult name to pronounce for me, um, who used to be Secretary of State for mm -hmm. King Henry VIII, et cetera, et cetera. And he was talking to, in the last story, um, uh, and, and the last bit was like a, opening a window to, a virtual window to the outside world, and you could see in a kind of a watercolored uh, version how Hackney used to be 400 years ago. Uh, and uh, Ralph says, um, uh, a lot of things have changed over the years, but my house and its stories are still here. Will you share them so they're not forgotten? So it's about like kind of inviting the person after all of the stories that they have heard and all this kind of knowledge that they might have got to reflect a little bit about their visit. And, you know, what does it mean to be there at a specific time, even if you didn't have the AR? You know what's the purpose of being in this building and and taking in all of the uh, of the memories uh, through through the stories through the objects physical or virtual that are in the house. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. It's very yeah, it's interesting the kind of the blend of the tech of the technology with 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 the the possibility of, of creating something that's 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 dramatic. Yeah, that's true. I can never say that word. Dramat dramaturgical. Dramatur dramaturgical. <laughs> <laughs> dramaturgical. Yeah. Um, it kind of, I don't know, it kind of has kind of, well, I guess it kind of has um, Brechtian kind of elements a little bit, that, that idea of trying to get people to kind of critically reflect. Yeah. And I'm still researching actually these parallels. I did, it was the first time with this project and I'm still researching uh, what I can borrow from that field and how it is, uh, how it is relevant to what we yeah. do in AR design. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really fascinating um i mean yeah there's so much this is this is one of these top this is one of these kind of podcasts where there's so many different things that you could, <laughs> that you could end up talking about you have to do a series now <laughs> do a series on, on all of this stuff um 
but yeah um so i guess we've got we've probably got about another sort of yeah maybe about another 10 minutes so we could we could probably talk a little bit about something slightly off you know, slightly off topic perhaps um so we've kind of covered we've covered a lot of about ar or ar experiences we've, we've kind of covered the mixed reality elements and how it all works and how and the kind of thing the kind of projects that you have so um we could talk a little bit i suppose about haptics if we have to, if we have time to discuss that do we have time to discuss that do you think i know it's not so much your field the more that, that ar but yeah haptics is also interesting i suppose yeah, yeah totally mm. um I mean, I have done some work with haptics in the past. So mm -hmm. haptics is a technology that allows you to uh, to feel and touch, in quotation marks, um, uh, virtual objects. Mm -hmm. And they come in many different shapes. In the past, and I mean, they're still in use, you had some kind of robotic arms that you could grab and, and hold. So it's kind of like a stylus in space. And this stylus would be connected with your computer. And if you have like a 3D environment where let's say you have a cube, uh, you had the stylus representation, like we have the pointer with the mouse, the stylus would be a sphere that could move in, in this 3D space. And when you would like uh, go close to one of the edges of the cube and you would touch it, uh, the uh, the robotic arm would create force feedback. So it would be, if you would close your eyes, it would be as if you had the actual cube in the space of the stylus. Um, so this was one of the of the devices that uh, that that exist. That, I mean, still exist. Um, but now you have also haptic gloves. There's a lot of research being done there. So you've got gloves that you can, you know, uh, you have like finger interaction as well. Um, so you can actually touch the uh, virtual objects with all your your fingers, and you can have a recreation of the sensation uh, in your hands. Mm, I mean, that is so cool. Yeah, and this I can uh, can be combined with uh, AR, of course, and VR. Um, so you you basically kind of recreate the reality <laughs> in in a virtual space um, yeah. with AR. Uh, yeah, you can actually touch, you know, the 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 virtual objects. I guess. Um, yeah, I mean something something kind of related to this, which we kind of I don't know if we touched on it exactly, but we have a, accessibility. Obviously, is a big part mm -hmm. of this as well. The fact mm -hmm. that you potentially yeah, absolutely could, yeah, you're giving people the potential, giving people who don't normally have the opportunity to touch things or to see things or to hear things easily because of the yeah. way museums are or the way art exhibits are or yeah. whatever you're giving them the opportunity to do this much more easily and yeah and also providing providing i mean so, you know some people interact with the world in a much more in a much more tactile way you know mm -hmm. and and for certain certain people with with um certain types of learning difficulties for example uh really want to touch things and so it's it's i think yeah. those kind of things are really powerful about it as well yeah, and there will and there yeah. will be there will be a lot of research on this topic uh, more and more now. Uh, mm -hmm. There's already some things happening with uh, Hololens for using sound for those who are visually impaired, um, but also th these technologies give you also different um, a different uh, avenue to do research for you know. Uh, th um, for for people with cognitive disabilities as well. Um, as well as and you know with mobility issues is like there's there's a lot of plethora of research that is being done in vr more because it has been more available as a technology but ar as well is starting now to uh to tackle these issues obviously um yeah yeah it's i mean yeah it's it's it's, it's really it's really interesting that that kind of thing and also i guess there's the element of if you're giving people that kind of tactile experience then you're kind of giving everyone can kind of share in that experience because that's 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 the part of the problem generally with tactile experiences is they tend to be quite limited like you know you go to an exhibit there's a hundred thousand people everyone can see something but not everyone has can touch it or can mm -hmm. can so you're kind of you're putting senses on a on a on a much more equal footing potentially which is mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which is also yeah. interesting i think and there, there's also things that you know uh, and not only because of the pandemic but because of you know people who might have also mobility issues for example they cannot very easily access these spaces 
uh, there's a lot of things you can do with both VR and AR glasses in at the house, at the home, yes. at their home. So yes. you know. Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, that's yeah, that's 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 another so another yeah things that stuff from home. Oh, we're living we're living a lot at the moment, like everything yeah. being at home. But anyway, but yeah, that that's that's another cool um, part of it. Okay, so just to, just to sort of finish up. Um, well, first of all, could just check, is there anyone in particular you'll, you'll play? I know you're going to have a break from the podcast, but is there anyone until, was it September? It, it was. Yeah, September yeah. is there. And I still need to transcribe a lot of them. It's, it's right. just one person uh, gig. So <laughs> is, there, is there anyone that you really want to, to, to interview or any particular company or group that you want to speak to? I have, yeah, well, I have a few people in mind that I have contacted already. So we should be starting um, in September again. Um, uh, not that I can think of now. Okay. So just, yeah, some various, various people who, who might be, might be interesting. And if you have in mind anyone, I'll be happy to. <laughs> if I can, yeah. If I, I mean, I don't know if I'm exactly the right person to, to suggest someone, but yeah, if I see anything, yeah. then I could, yeah, could maybe could maybe suggest it great okay um i guess so um it would be nice to have like a concluding kind of remark or 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 a kind of statement of how powerful this technology could be and how it could change people's lives for the better so do you think you can you can you know not not all not everything in their life but some some elements of their life some elements, so do, yeah. yeah so do you think do you think you can make a statement like that Oh. Well, that would be a bold statement. I don't know. I think I, I would say that, again, with proper design, that the uh, AR, I mean, NVR can, um, can offer this kind of embodied uh, experience that uh, can give a different kind of understanding of, you know, history uh, and culture as well to people who, you know, visit either in person or, you know, from remotely um, these uh, places. Uh, but it is all, it's not, I mean, for me, it's not all about the technology, but it is not about how, but it's about how you design this technology. So, mm. uh, and this is where my work is as well at the moment. I've, I've used this dramaturgy to do this project and I have developed a, a design framework for developing AR um, experiences in heritage with an emphasis on creating this uh, affective uh, atmosphere that can keep people engaged and therefore learn. Uh, but it is a, it's an, it's a, it's an area of research that is super rich and that I'm, you know, still discovering and, and creating things in there. I think the design is, is, is very important, is very important to, to everything. Uh, mm. And also the um, the will, I guess, to use this technology to do a, a few, bit more uh, groundbreaking things. I think also that it is a technology that can help a lot with the decolonization process. Uh, so I think we're going to see we're going to be seeing it more and more now uh, in museums and heritage sites. And uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just looking forward to see what uh, uh, what the future will bring, both yeah. in terms of the apps that will be designed, but also in terms of hardware, because we're yes. going to be having more and a more like, you know, um, easier to use, but more importantly, affordable uh, glasses for the for the public. Yes. Yeah. All this research, uh, at least from my perspective that I'm doing, is with the understanding that in the future, people would be able to go to these places with their own glasses and, and go through this experience. Yeah, I guess the products need to be there for people to... to, to, to of course, it. of course. And we're not, you know, we're not really close to, the, to that no. state yet, but, um, but there is considerable research being done on the backstage for this, uh, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, just to kind of sum up, it, it kind of feels a lot like it could be a really powerful tool for uh, people like me, progressives and people on the left who would like to present like alternative histories to things that, that are just missing in, from our kind of understanding in, in, in education and in, in cultural mm -hmm. history normally. And also it kind of, it gives a sort of, 
it's a little bit utopian, some of the thinking around it. I mean, any technology provokes that kind of reaction, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the fact that it's so embodied and it's so kind of, we're not, we're going to avoid the word immersive, (laughs) but (laughs) the fact that it's so embodied and gives people an actual, you know, can potentially give people a, a really good experience and 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 learn new things um in that way yeah i mean an ar right now can also be used uh, like mobile ar uh Mm. easily without necessarily needing like a lot of programming and or 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 anything can be used as a tool as you said for this kind of an activist tool in a sense yeah Um, whilst we've been talking i've had like three or four like activist (laughs) projects like oh you could do this maybe you could (laughs) maybe you could do that or yeah yeah yeah, and absolutely and uh, you know it's something you can do without even like much knowledge of programming there's so many tools now in that you can create they can help you create mobile ar um yeah it's really interesting maybe i need to i need to re uh what's the word i need to retrain (laughs) retrain (laughs) away from oh well Away from teaching on Zoom. And a summer project, maybe. <laughs> summer, yes, if I, if, I, if I get time. Yeah, good. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, thank Marisa. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, make sure we get the, a quick uh, reminder about, your, uh, about the, 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 the podcast, uh, the Mixed Reality and Cultural Heritage podcast. Yeah, so we can find it in anchor.fm, uh, and it's available, as you said, in Spotify and a few other uh, platforms as well. Yeah. So it's Apple Podcasts and uh, etc. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you're going to have a link or something can send you a link. Yeah, we can put it I can, yeah. when I put it up on... It's on pause at the moment. We still have, I think, uh, eight episodes. So that was season one. And we're going to start again in September with the second season. Yeah, that would be tackling more challenges. <laughs> yes, indeed. So yes, yeah, so I'm sure we can. Yeah, I can put a link into the into the description so people can find it um, if they come across the, the 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 podcast. And so yeah, that is is really great. Kensal and Kilburn Better 2021 are behind this podcast, which is who I represent. And um, we'll hopefully have some more podcasts and uh, episodes talking about various things in the future. So thank you very much and uh, see you soon.